Hello and namaste everyone. Uh, welcome to the fifth episode of Wildland Life Seminar Series, uh, which is hosted by Small Mammals Conservation Research Foundation. And uh, I'm Varsha Rai from SMCRF, the moderator for today's session. And uh, in the course of uh, inviting several experts to this talk, uh, to share about their works in the field of biodiversity con research and conservation and other biodiversity related issues, including small mammals since the past few months. Uh, today we have Dr. Bhargavi Srinivasalu. She's uh, the research associate at the Department of Zoology and Center for Biodiversity and Conservation Studies, Osmania University, Hyderabad, India. Uh, Dr. Bhargavi is a trained zoologist, skilled in morpho and molecular taxonomy, feeding ecology of insectivorous bats, bat acoustic and conservation biology. Uh, she uh, was awarded with her PhD in 2002 from Osmania University, Hyderabad, for her studies on the ecology of bats, uh, sorry, birds in agri-ecosystems. Agri and since then, her research interest has shifted from bat birds to bats. And uh, she's completed three major research projects on bats funded by Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, Department of Biotechnology and the University Res uh, Grants Commission, UGC, Government of India since 2003 as a postdoctorate. And she was also the India partner in UGC, UK India Education and Research Initiative and Department of Science and Technology, uh, UK Re International Research Projects of Depa Department of Zoology, Osman University and School of Biological Sciences, University of Bristol, UK. And she has contributed to over 53 uh, sorry, 50 peer-reviewed peer research papers, three books, and has also contributed to IUCN Red List assessments of many species of bats and reptiles. And apart from scientific researches, Dr. Bhargavi has been conducting conservation education and awareness programs in India, and is also a two-time grantee of the Mohammed bin Zaid Species Conservation Fund, and also secured has secured Rufort Small Grants as well for the conservation of Kolar leaf nose bat in India. Uh, so without uh, delay, uh, now, without delay, I would like to welcome Dr. Bhargavi for her talk, and the title for her talk will be Conservation Actions, a Case Study of Collar Leaf Nose Bat. And before moving on to the session, I would also like to notify everybody that the session is being recorded and will be posted in the official Facebook page of SMCRF and its YouTube channel as well. If you have any questions, feel, please uh, feel free to drop them in the chat box and we will address them at the end of the presentation. So, hope you enjoy. So, over to you, Dr. Bhargavi. Uh, I'll be making you the host for the session so that you can share your presentation. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I think now you have the share screen option available on your screen now. Yeah. Can you see that? Uh, yes, ma'am. It is good. Yes. It is visible. Yeah. yeah. So, do I start now? Hello? Show, sure, ma'am. Show, sure, ma'am. Yeah. So, thank you, Varsha, for the lovely introduction um, of whatever I said to you. Before I begin, I'm thankful to SMCRF, especially to um, my good friend Sanjan Thapa and Ms. Varsha Rai for having invited me to share my experiences in the field of conservation uh, on this platform. Thank you very much. So let's begin uh, my talk. Um, in, when, 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 when we, uh, you know, when uh, we talk about uh, human beings, the Greek of uh, philosophers and scientists like Aristotle, Galen, and all these people, they were very curious about uh, human beings. And then they started to, you know, dissect uh, uh, various animals and also human corpses and then trying to find out whether, you know, uh, we came down from the gods or what is what is it all about human beings? And then we, they came to know that there is no difference in the tissues or, the, or in the systems or in the workings of the uh, uh, humans and the various animals that they used to dissect and then see. And then slowly they came to realize that we were not created, 
but we evolved over a course of over a period of time. And so Aristotle famously regarded humans as uh, political animals. Uh, as time moved on, we had great scientists like you know uh, Charles Darwin, Thomas Huxley, and uh, Ernst Haeckel. All these people they they very clearly demonstrated that we got evolved and not created. So they refuted the creationist theory that was being circulated at that point of time. And although we share 98% of our DNA with the chimpanzees, there is a huge difference between us and them for a reason that we can cook food over fire. That's the major difference um, that made us humans from and chimpanzees the chimps so the 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 most important pivotal uh, point of time where we moved from you know being uh, 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 ape like our ancestors moved from ape like ancestors to slowly and slowly human looking like is the fact that we started to consume meat and that was like two and a half million years ago and we used to scavenge or sometimes hunt and then we used to eat meat. And uh, at that time, our teeth were also still quite big and then we used to spend around 25 to 30% of the time chewing. But due to lightning or something of that sort, we used to have forest fires and then we discovered this surprising new element called forest uh, uh, fire. And we experimented uh, in you know you know putting our meat that we have scavenged or hunted into the fire and then taking it out and then popping it into our mouth and then we felt that it tasted different and it, it tasted good so this this helped us to understand that you know this is what something that we can adapt to and slow slowly and slowly we we uh, bettered our hunting techniques and if we were scavenging also we we started to make tools to to you know uh, be able to cut through the flesh through the uh, thick skins of the animals and then get the uh, you know tender flesh cook it and then eat it so what happened is our our teeth started to become smaller and our jaws and all those things become, started to become slender and our intestines started to become shorter. So there is, so what happened is um, we didn't need to chew for such a long period of time. So that's the reason because we were cooking our food on, on fire and then that was like half the chewing time taken by the fire itself. So when the teeth started getting smaller and the jaw muscles and everything started to get slender, it so happened that, you know, we had a lot of space uh, in our head. So our skull size increased and so we could accommodate a bigger and a better brain size. And then slowly and slowly our intelligence improved and then we could, you know, develop the capacity of having language. So that's, that's, that's how we all, you know, slowly and slowly progress to what we are till now. And from there, we started to understand the importance of animals as, as, as a part of uh, our nourishment. And also, we used to also, uh, um, you know, fear them for a reason that, you know, they, they would kill us if we were careless. But also, fear sometimes leads to reverie. So we used to rever them, fear them, and also rever them. And... This slowly led to, you know, uh, 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 us, uh, 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 you know, ritualistically, uh, you know, revering, say, cave bears or crocodiles and uh, uh, cats and all those things. So we used to, we used to start, we started to more and more associate with animals as, as prehistoric human beings slowly used to care for uh, smaller, younger animals, and then they became our companions. So we started our domestication process, and um, uh, and also all these aspects got slowly and slowly forming into rituals. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. 
sorry for that. And the evidence of us, uh, you know, uh, revering animals can be seen through various civilizations uh, and in our cave paintings of, you know, prehistoric humans that uh, how those kind those animals used to look like at that time. And then you, in various civilizations that you can see over here that I have just tried to picture, we can see us revering animals and uh, certain, uh, you know, uh, imaginary uh, persons as gods or, you know, the Mother Earth as God that, you know, you give all these bounties, so I should worship you and I should, you know, sacrifice certain things to you so that, you know, you can give me more and more, uh, uh, you know, bountiful things so that my uh, clan can survive in lean periods of time and all those things. So uh, if you see uh, uh, in this picture over here, it's, it's, uh, they, the Egyptian civilization used to rever all types of uh, animals. Over here, it's uh, ibis, then we had cat, then we also had something called Sobek. Um, he was uh, a human uh, in the, uh, with a head of uh, a crocodile. So that a form was worshipped a lot and, uh, you know, lakes were constructed for maintaining crocodiles and then, you know, taking care of them, feeding them. And so it was more like a sac sacred lake for the survival of Sobek. So these are from Harappan and uh, Indus Valley civilizations and all those things. As, as the worshipping and all continued, we, we do not exactly know whether, uh, 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 Apart from one or two evidences from, uh, say, Egyptian empire that, you know, there were sacred lakes for uh, crocodiles. We exactly do not know if there is any written document, whether uh, uh, any conservation was held, uh, taken care, uh, taking place to conserve animals uh, in, in any part of the civilization. So when we, when we see the texts by um, the Ch Chandragupta Maurya Empire, one of the greatest empires uh, to have ruled in the Indian subcontinent, we can see that there are certain texts, li like for example, uh, the Arthashastra, written by the Prime Minister Chanakya of the empire. So in that, uh, it shows that, you know, mm, there was an official forest department and there were uh, people called Vanapalas, or the forest guards who were looking after the uh, forests of the empire. And they had to go about along with the official, the superintendent of the forest department, and then classify all the birds and animals and the trees. And permissions had to be sought from the forest department to access uh, those uh, trees and plants for any you know, medicinal purposes or any such thing. And also strict laws were in place wherein you, if, if you exhibit any cruelty towards animals, you would be penalized and punished severely uh, during his reign. This continued uh, to his, uh, in, in, in uh, uh, Ashoka the Great's time, uh, who was his uh, you know, grandson, he was much more stringent with the laws and he was the one who started, uh, 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 you know, formulating laws for conservation of wildlife as such. And on his, uh, uh, you know, this is the Ashoka pillar, on his pillar, there are something, the, the, there are these texts which are called as the pillar edicts in that it is very clearly uh, uh, written as to how protection of wildlife should be taken, uh, should be carried out. And uh, 
as during the course of time he became he converted into buddhism and then he followed ahimsa very stringently and then he banned all sorts of killing of animals and killing of any animal whether it is domesticated or wild slaughtering of animals all these were banned by him completely so he was very very stringent about protecting of uh, wildlife during his uh, reign then after the you know uh, mauryan empire we also had another wonderful uh, great equally greater empire ruling the indian subcontinent the the mughal empire very uh, brilliant uh, 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 um, emperors were present they used to admire nature we have many museums uh, in india and elsewhere wherein you have beautiful paintings of um uh, of of wildlife of nature um and everything in their in in their paintings they have also recorded uh, or documented various kinds of uh uh flora fauna the climate the geography as to how the forest looks like in sir in various areas uh in the indian subcontinent in their reign so th this is uh, babar nama written by you know uh emperor babar who was the first mogul king who arrived in india so he recorded the geography the climate and various flora and fauna elements of of india in in jiske jahangiri which is a document written by uh, jahangir he has also contributed equal amounts as uh, emperor babar did in fact very interestingly he uh, during his reign uh documented the uh, fauna of kashmir uh, at that time and that is the first documented uh, uh, list of animals in kashmir so he was very very uh, all these mogul emperors emperors were very interested uh, and uh, uh, in, they used to enjoy wildlife and nature lot but at the same time they used to love hunting and it was a matter of prestige to whether it is moguls or the maharajas it was a matter of prestige and and uh, valor and chivalry to show off that you know i can hunt a tiger or a lion uh, so they used to uh, you know hunt lions tigers deer ask me what everything and um, unfortunately cheetahs became extinct by indiscriminate hunting that used to happen they used to love hunting the blue bull the nilgai because it used to be rampant everywhere the the local communities used to feed on them they used the the emperors used to organize parties especially to uh, um i mean hunting parties not the parties that we use um hunting parties to you know hunt all these uh, neel guys and then they used to conduct feasts and then they used to feast on them also they used to donate all the uh, hunted uh, flesh to you know the poor but they used to love hunting the big game the the rhinos um uh, lions and tigers it, there are there are records of you know rhinos being hunted by i guess uh, akbar uh, during his time so they used to love hunting the uh, big game a lot and as this was going on the the east india company you know uh, came into picture in 1627 and they along with the moguls and the maharajas they used to love um uh, you know they 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 started loving the sport of hunting it used to give them a adrenaline rush kind of thing and uh, uh so they used to organize these huge uh shikars and then they used to go out and then hunt tigers especially white tigers for a reason tigers were called the cruel 
uh, animals because they used to come and then uh, attack their uh, you know uh, laborers or the staff who were working in in on their lands under their uh, in their company rule so in the guise of protection of these staff they used to you know hunt the tigers saying that you know i'm killing the man many to kind of but also they used to organize huge hunting parties as you can see over here and then it used to if if it was only uh hunting the manito or killing the manito it should have been one or two which should have been fine but during these shikars they used to hunt as many tigers as they can come across over many days or a period of many days and they used to be joined by the local maharajas also and they used to also uh you know um, organize uh hunting parties uh, in 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 honor of the british officers and they used to all go together and then hunt and then feast and all so all these factors contributed to a drastic decline in 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 the in the in the tiger population especially and the population of big game and other birds and animals but tigers started to tiger numbers started to you know decrease quite drastically at the same time you know we also had some of the officers or some of the you know uh some officers of 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 the empire Uh, the british empire were, were dedicated to nature and they documented nature like oxen rotten riley you 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 all know the names so presently of my at the top of my head i can't remember but many officers contributed to the uh documentation of wildlife and also they started to advocate for the protection of of wildlife um uh, i have a few, uh, you know few names like for example doctor um, like um colonel richard burton edward stemmings then reginald herbert all these people they would advocate and then pressurize the government to ban rewarding the killing of tigers and also they would pressurize the government to to you know setting up of wildlife sanctuaries now this is james edward james cobbett so he along with sir malcolm haley he was uh, sir malcolm haley was the governor of Kumau uh, area, and then he, along with the governor, and the governor was very, very interested in in wildlife, and he was very much wanting someone to collaborate with him. So Jim Corbett, along with him, you know, uh, worked together between thirty three and thirty five, nineteen thirty three and thirty five, and they set up a wildlife sanctuary in the name of Sir Malcolm Haley. It was earlier called Haley's. uh sanctuary over there for the protection of tiger and they also formulated uh policies for the protection of tiger many many uh you know mm, documents were written which we can see in in the bombay natural history society collection are uh, written by many british officers which are very incredibly valuable uh for us to see that uh, you we can get a glimpse of uh the nature and the species diversity in in that era at that time and then those were the works on whom we still depend upon for the for the diversity of any species and their distribution so these kind of people they were the stalwart stalwarts who who came up with many acts like you know uh, um, bengal uh, uh, what's that mm. 
Bengal Rhinoceros Protection Act, Elephant Preservation Act, Nilgiri Fish and Game Preservation Act, and such such kind of things like what you can see over here. So all these acts were uh, being formulated and then passed uh, uh, passed by the government uh, of of. of uh, the the East India Company, the, the British government at that time, alongside hunting that was happening, but this was also happening at the same time. As as this was also happening, there was also uh, a, a, these were some of the officers who were doing, but there was also a, a, a kind of gradual shift happening uh, among the um, other. British officers that, you know, yes, we need to conserve, you know, the forests and the wildlife for a couple of reasons. One reason was this, that, you know, yes, the, 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 the forests are dwindling and the numbers of the, you know, uh, animals are falling down. So we need to conserve them. That's that. That was one of the positive things. But also they wanted to conserve forests. Uh, so that you know, uh, the 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 it, 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 they wanted to decimate forests so that they can build infrastructure like railroads or towns and cities and all. And also, they have conserved patches of forests for also for for commercial purposes also, so that you know you can uh, harvest the teak and then it it can be transported. Uh, to to various places where you know you can uh, 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 make huge ships for trade to happen or for the for the construction of uh, rail uh, bogies so that you know transport and uh, you know trade trade can happen between the states in India ships for you know international trade and all such kind of things was also there and also they wanted to preserve and protect the wildlife so that one on one side you have this positive impact that you know the, the wildlife should be protected because you know their numbers are dwindling the wildlife should be protected because their numbers are dwindling and it will not sustain our imperial sport so if we protect wildlife our imperial sport of hunting the tigers or the lions or the elephants can be supported. So that's the reason why it should be, they should be protected. So that was one uh, viewpoint that was all that was going on. And another viewpoint is, you know, dwindling of numbers of major game animals and then they need to be taken care of. So these were both going side by side along with the documentation and also the official work of the British Empire was going on. So the, the British left post-independence, it was still going on. The, uh, you know, hunting of tigers, the lions, uh, rhinos was still going on. There was no stopping because, uh, and, and, and trade of skin was going on very rapidly. And to such an extent that, the the for example the 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 numbers of uh, lions dropped to double digits because of which I hope I'm not mistaken because of which the the Maharaja of Junagarh which is in Gujarat he had to you know he 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 was really alarmed by the situation and then he just gave up a huge chunk of land under his jurisdiction and declared it as a wildlife sanctuary for the exclusive protection of the lions so that they can survive over there. They were relegated to such a small pocket of land. Okay. Now it is called Sasangir area. So that, that whole area is designated as a wildlife sanctuary. It was back then by the Maharaja of Chinaga. Now, when, it, when we come to the, the case of tiger or the elephants, they were all relegated to certain pockets. The, the rhino was relegated to Northeast Indian pocket only that it was, it was, its population was more and more shrinking by the day because of the poaching and trade of its parts and you know, all those things happening. So in 1969, it so happened that 
the general and the 10th general assembly of iucn happened in india and uh, we had great stalwarts of I mean, of conservation like safar fulkehali salim ali sa mm, you know kailash sankhala all these people they represented uh, the, the 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 conservationists of the subcontinent and uh they 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 spoke in detail about you know the plight of the tigers and the other big game animals in india and all of these people sat together in in the iucn assembly and then they came up with you know certain uh you know uh, ways to how how to go about in conservation of the of the tiger and so the 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 iucn then pressurized the then prime minister mrs indira gandhi to take this issue seriously and then start protecting the tiger because we had the largest population of tiger uh, in the indian subcontinent elsewhere the tiger was literally in in very 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 few numbers and certain species had gotten extinct also we were on the verge of extinction so we had to really take an urgent action to protect the tiger to start with okay so then in in uh, 19 this this pressurizing and this sm this meeting and all those things resulted in the formulation of wildlife protection act in 1972 and the launching of Pro project tiger to conserve the uh, uh, tiger in in india in 1973 so slowly and slowly one by one you know tiger reserves were being are uh, uh, designated and the the populations of tigers in those areas were being protected and conserved then this uh, you know this was uh, becoming slowly and slowly successful so this led to the formulation of project elephant in 1992 and now recently project rhino so these are helpful in 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 the protection of these big species and so because of the protection of uh, these big, uh, big big gun species the other smaller species are also getting protected their their habitat is getting protected and those forest pockets uh, are now in 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 good condition because of these project tiger project elephant and project shrine uh, uh, projects at the same time there arrived in the scene miss sally walker sally rolston walker from uh, america in 1975 she was a yoga and a sanskrit enthusiast she wanted to learn more about these things and in her spare time she was you know volunteering in mysore zoo in karnataka south india and there it it's it's a wonderful zoo even today if you go and see it's a beautiful zoo and everything was fine but the thing is the the people were the the visitors were mistreating the animals trying to you know hit them or feed them or things like that but the staff were very wonderful very patient and they were taking care of the uh, animals housed in the zoo but only the visitors were causing a lot of misery to the animals so she came up with uh, you know friends of zoo uh, group and then later on that idea grew and then now and then later she founded the zoo outreach organization that we all know this was primarily started to help zoos all over india to maintain a certain standard of of taking care of the welfare of the animals in a particular manner you know visitor education and putting up of barricades and you know things like that. taking care of animals in a particular manner and having a standard protocol across all the zoos in the whole of india that's how she was doing it and her efforts led to the 
a formulation of Indian Zoo Act in 1991. And she was the one who was instrumental in starting the regional CBSG network in, in India, in, in actually in South Asia. Okay. Then she was later on joined by Dr. Sanjay Malur and Dr. B.A. Daniel. Um, B. A. Daniel, Dr. B.A. Daniel had, you know, his uh, invertebrate expertise. Dr. Sanjay Malur has his vertebrate expertise. So Sally, Sanjay and Daniel put together, they started various regional networks like Sisinsa Chiroptera Conservation and Information Network of South Asia, Resinsa, that is for rodents and insectivores, then primate network group and all those for various taxonomic groups, they started regional networks so that for, for the conservation of all these you know, lesser known animals. And after the formulation of Sisinsa in particular, because I'm a bat biologist, I want to talk to talk about bats. So in particular, after the establishment of Sisinsa, she started to lobby to the government saying that we, in the Wildlife Protection Act, it so happened that all the uh, bats were relegated to vermin category, That which means to say you can shoot them, eat them, whatever. It's, it's your wish. It was like that. But she, after she form, formed the Sisinsa group and then we all got into the Sisinsa group and then uh, taking all our inputs and her own expertise, ex, uh, uh, you know, experiences, she started to, you know, pursue the government to shift at least the fruit bats from Burman category to the uh, uh, protected category. And it, she consistently, you know, pursued the government so much so that, you know, they have been shifted to protected category. All the rest of the insectivorous, insectivorous bats were not even mentioned in the uh, uh, Wildlife Protection Act, but at least now they are mentioned and they are all under Schedule 4. And two species of bats, namely sat Latidin salimali, that is Salimali's fruit bat, and uh, Otomops rotoni. These two bats at that point of time were known from single locations and that was single case. And so she, she really, you know, pursued the government uh, and researchers who were working on those bats. They were, uh, they were in the group, uh, in the Sisinsa group. So their inputs also helped her. And then she, she, Success. Uh, she was successful in, persu in, 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 in persuading the government to shift these two species to schedule one of the Wildlife Protection Act, which means to say we cannot uh, touch them or you know uh, access their caves without uh, proper uh, permission. I I don't think we can do uh, scientific collection also. So they are highly protected now and. Uh, so, uh, many studies have been done on these species and then fortunately now Latidin Selimali is known from more than one location and Otomops Rotoni, which was known from one cave in Karnataka is also known from Northeast India in Meghalaya in Siju cave. So she, she was, uh, she has been an inspiration to many and especially to me because she was, she, she worked tremendously for the conservation of many species in, in, in the Indian subcontinent, in the whole of the South Asia. That leads to the Kola leaf nose bat, the hero of the show. So as uh, one more small thing I wanted to tell you, as she formulated all these networks, what she did was, she just didn't formulate the networks and inform members and then keep those groups just like that. She used to hold camp workshops and PHVAs uh, consistently over a period of time so that you know we can share a lot of information about each and every species of animal of that group. For example, in Sisinsa. So she, she held a um, couple of camps one in 1997 and one in 2002. In 2002, 
uh, the camp workshop uh, uh, that was held uh, assist nine endemic bats as threatened with extinct, extinction, among which was the, you know, uh, was Hippocytrus hypophilus. It was a recently discovered, uh, you know, a described bat. And for, for, for at least 1994 till it was described, everybody thought, whoever had worked on it, thought it was Hippocytrus pomna. Okay. So now this bat was, this species was collected from Kolar district, which is in Karnataka, South India, from two places, Theralli and Hanmanalli. And it was, it was uh, at that time in, in, in from 1970s onwards, epidemiological, oh, it was a very twisted word. Uh, surveys were being conducted by National Institute of Virology, which is in Pune, to uh, assess the viral loads in bats and any antibodies because of the viruses in bats. They wanted to research that. So they used to capture lots of, you know, specimens of bats from various locations in South, A South India. And then they used to take it back to NIV and study the bats and also their viruses and then record. So when these collections were happening, there were, you know, few teens like Banerjee at all, you know, uh, mm, yeah, Bhatt and Jacob, then Sripada at all. All these people, they studied these bats, did some karyological uh, 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 studies and different other studies. And then uh, they, they published their finding, but they all thought that this species is Hippocytrus pomona. They, they did not pay attention to a very unique character that was there in this particular species of bat. So during the studies of uh, Dr. H.R. Butt, he was a virologist from uh, NIV Pune. He was joined by Dieter Koch, from, who was a bat biologist from Germany. So he came down, these both were, you know, looking at these uh, bats and then they were preparing for the conference, bat conference, and then these people found a very unique character in this, in this bat. And that is this, a single supplementary leaflet under the anterior leaf. This is a single supplementary leaflet under the anterior leaf of this particular species of bat. So, this is not found in any of the bicolor species. So if you take pomona also, it doesn't have supplementary leaflets. So this is very easily distinguishable from Hippocytrus pomona. So it cannot be a pomona at all. That's what they came to know very clearly. And then they published a paper in 1994 describing the species as Hippocytrus hypophilus. Hypophilus is leaf under, hypo is under, okay. Uh, there is a leaf under, under there. So some, they published a, 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 a paper and they have written in their paper that they could collect, you know, specimens from Theralli and Hanunali. And this was, these, this was based on collections done in 1980s, 19, uh, 1980s onwards. And all the other uh, uh, authors that I was talking to you about, who had studied and, and done gynecological uh, uh, studies on them, all these papers gave information, all these papers along with the information from 1994, we could know that, you know, these bats are threatened with mining and they are found only in those, these two places and nowhere else in the whole of India, in the whole of South India at least, nowhere else. And one of the authors, that is Shripada at all, he said that, you know, they said that, you know, God knows if the population is still existing. There have been many, uh, you know, researchers like Dr. Ricky Krishnan uh, from IIC Bangalore long ago, 
Uh, God bless his soul. He's presently no more. So sorry about that. Uh, Dr. Srinivasalu, they all have conducted uh, surveys in the surrounding areas, but could not find any trace of this bat at all. So it remained unknown till quite some time. We didn't know anything apart from these publications. No information existed in, about this bat apart from this publication. And also no pictures of this bat apart from a, a drawing of a nose leaf and a drawing of an ear. Nothing else existed about this bat. We didn't know how it looked like. We just knew that it had single pair of leaflets, very, very unique character throughout the world among the hypocytrids. So in uh, 2013, uh, I got very interested in, in, I had finished my second postdoc, so I got very interested about this bat as to how come there's nothing known about this? And then so I, I got funding from MBC um, and I, I took up surveys uh, in the whole of Karnataka because I wanted to search for this bat and also the, document the diversity of bats uh, throughout Karnataka. And um, as I was doing that, I started my survey in, in Kolar and uh, I first thing what I did was I, I spoke to the local forest department. I said, this is what I wanted to do. And I wanted a local person who knew those places so that, you know, uh, who, who knew everything about those places so that, you know, he can, they can guide me uh, uh, how to go about in those areas. So this is one of the young uh, foresters over here. So he was, uh, he, he took us uh, around in Terali. So this is Terali uh, area, bouldery, hilly habitat with lots of plains. And at, the, at, at, at that time, it used to feel very, very cold in, in the months of November and December that we, uh, we had to wear double jackets. It used to be very cold. It is in South India. It's generally warm, but that particular place, because Therali means place in clouds. So it used to be a very beautiful place surrounded by hills and a plain in the middle, and it used to be very, very cold. So we searched the entire area. We walked through the entire place and we searched for any caves. This is one of the caves over here. I'm along with my team members, Dr. Harpreet Kaur, Mr. Tariq Ahmed Shah, uh, Mr. Devender, uh, at that time. Later on, I was joined by Dr. Srinivaslu and uh, Mr. Aditya Srinivaslu uh, the next year onwards. So these were all my team members. So we were searching for various caves. Over here, we found one cave and then we saw there were lots of, you know, uh, Hippocytra uh, spheres, um, you know, Rhinopoma, Hadwikit, Aphosos, and all. But no other bat species we could find. So we were like, what to do and it was quite in the night. And then uh, whenever I'm serving, I ask the village elders because they would be knowing, uh, because more than the youngsters, the village elders would be knowing about various localities where they used to go in when they were young to while taking their livestock for, you know, foraging and all. So I was sitting at the doorstep of one of the village elders and then he was talking to me in a local language and then this boy was trying to translate that to me. So the village elder informed me that there was a subterranean cave down in one of these areas for to which I came back later on. But at that point of time, I did not, you know, uh, go and explore. Then I searched and uh, went to Hanmanali. Now you might be thinking it was already mentioned in the publication and how come you wouldn't know because the the coordinates that were given uh it it read as though hanman ali is just beyond terali just here the next hill is hanman ali that's how the coordinates translated to at that uh, uh, when we when we uh, you know uh, converted those coordinates that were written in in the publication so we searched everywhere and then 
uh, we didn't find, and then we uh, we 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 went and then asked uh, uh, the local bus conductors, the bus people, and then they guided us to Hanmanalli, and then so we went to Hanmanalli. Now this is Hanmanalli. As we were walking towards the village of Hanmanalli, on our right we found this. This is a huge monolith granite hill on which mining was happening. And when we saw, we saw that, you know, there were lots of trucks up there. This is the summit over here. Uh, it's more towards that side. Uh, we are just on the slope. Up, uh, much more up there is, 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 is the summit. And then, you know, uh, uh, they used to, there were lots of trucks and there were lots of people cutting the granite if you can see over here so what they used to do is they would you know make holes in the granite uh, on the four sides of the uh, granite slab and they used to stuff hay into that and then they used to uh, burn the hay because of the high heat and also cover these uh, stone by hay and the whole of the hay used to get caught, get caught on fire because of the high heat, the, the stone would break and it's easy for a broken stone to be broken into smaller pieces to be transported out. And these pieces of granite were transported to various cities for, you know, uh, uh, being used in, in various infrastructure projects or in residential areas. So that was being done. And just opposite the this hill where we were standing, this is this is us standing over here back then in 2013. And just opposite us, another hill was being uh, 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 mined. It was three fourth mined already by the time we reached Hanmanalli. It was three fourth mined, almost flat. It was still going on, and we saw the state of affairs over here. So. We, we asked some of the people who were here and then we came across an, an elderly person who was, just, who was just walking by as we were trying to climb up the hill. And then we asked him that, you know, we are interested in bats. Has he seen any bat caves or any such thing over here? And then he said, to the side of the hill, there is there are caves. That's what he said, to, to this side of the hill, he said there are caves. So we didn't know how, where the caves were. So we just climbed and then we started to look for the caves. And then as we climbed, we have seen all this devastation all over the hill that was going on. This is all cut stone over here. Can you see? This is the original hill and this is the cut area. So as we were walking, we came to the, we were almost going to the other side of the hill and then we, got a very strong whiff of guano. And then we frantically started searching everywhere for a cave. And we found this, okay? So this is between two granite, large granite slabs. This is a small subterranean cave. We shown our, uh, uh, we, we shined our torch lights into the cave and then we could see because of the torch light glare, few bats fluttering around. So we thought, okay, this might be one of the caves. We start searching elsewhere on the side of the, you know, hill, under uh, uh, large trees, everywhere we searched, but we couldn't find any more openings like this, only this one. So we waited till the evening and as the, uh, and and uh, we, we set up mist nets in the evening around 6.15ish and 6.30 onwards, the bats started to emerge. There were very few bats, they were emerging. So, and we could see, you know, they were emerging in pockets uh, for certain periods of time. Then there were gaps wherein there is no bat movement. Then again, after some time, you know, after five, 10 minutes, again, bats would be coming out. So we started uh, doing that. If you can see over here, and we caught the uh, bats. We were all wearing our headlamps because it was uh, night and then we were catching bats. We wanted to sit there and uh, take pictures and then 
release the bats immediately. Take wing punches and then release the bats immediately. But uh, it so happened that we were we uh, we heard very strong shouts and torchlights running towards us from far. Uh, uh, I feel a large group that was coming towards us. So they all thought that you know we might be you know smuggling the stones away. So they started shouting. Uh, and we got scared. We packed our mist nets. Uh, all these bats that we had caught, we had caught around ten individuals. We put them in separate cloth bags carefully, and then tied uh, those cloth bags to our bags so that you know those bats can breathe. And then we ran to the highway, which was being newly constructed, which with it, which is just half a kil, not even half a kilometer away. Just. Uh, Less than half a kilometer away it was. So we went to that. We literally ran. We we picked up everything and then stuffed it and then we ran for our lives because we were very worried because all these miners were coming from, uh, from from afar, and we didn't want to get hurt because we had all these bats with us. So we sat on the on the side of the highway, and we started to take pictures of each individual. And we could take we when we when we saw this bat, the most beautiful bat I have ever seen in my whole life. This is Hippocytus hypophyllus. If you can see, this is the supplementary leaf that you can see, and the whole of the nose leaf looks like a beautiful flower, which is perched upon its nose. This is the most beautiful bat that we have ever seen. And this is for the first time we have photographed Hippocytus hypophyllus. And we were doing this, taking wing punches, releasing the bats, keeping one or two with us. All the rest, we started to take pictures, uh, take echolocation calls, take their measurements, stay, uh, and releasing them uh, safely back to the wild after resting them for a few minutes in the cloth bags we used to do that and it became quite late in the night we missed our last bus back to the Kular town so we had to you know sleep on the pavement we were we were sleeping on the pavement over here so once we got that we we, we, we got information about all this and we had uh, at that time two specimens with us and we also found a particular uh, uh, species which we could not identify at that time, along with other species. Like we 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 saw hypophyllus, we identified it because of the single leaflet. Then we also had Hippocytus fioris, Hippocytus fulvus, and another Hippocytus that we couldn't identify at that time. It was a bicolor species, but we couldn't identify it. It was not a pomona also. So we, uh, we uh, you know, retained two specimens of that, two specimens of, you know, uh, hypophyllus. And then we, you know, did some more surveys and then we came back to the headquarters. The first thing that we did was to do scientific work immediately on our watcher specimens, because whatever conservation you want, we want to do, it should always be based on scientific knowledge, on scientific facts. So immediately we got upon working on uh, detailed measurements, pictures of every part, uh, then you know skull morphology, bacula morphology, then molecular uh, 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 you know uh, barcoding. Everything we wanted to do it, we did in a systematic manner. And as we were doing the bacula morphology of the second species that we could not identify, we found that it was a Durgala seal. How did we identify it? It was based on the seal-shaped baculum. That is characteristic feature of Hippocytus Durgala seal. And Durgala seal was found only in Madhya Pradesh. And this is the second location that we were reporting. So we wanted to report these two things simultaneously. and so. Immediately, we wrote our uh, research papers and then put them out uh, into journals, submitted them to journals, and uh, we, we we started to you know do uh, 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 outreach activities because 
the mine that we saw it was just 100 meters away from the only cave which was holding so many species of bats that to the cola the the, the hippocytus hypophilus and another uh, endangered bat the dugada sicilicus so two endangered species two, two one was vulnerable and one is endangered that was a huge risky position so we wanted to really really immediately conserve or or protect this these species so first scientific facts went out and then we we wrote a you know a appeal kind of paper into in, uh, uh, short paper into oryx trying to attract the scientific community attention saying that you know we need to protect these bats because they we saw that you know they were very very few in numbers in the in the next year in 2014 when we came when we went back every few months we used to go there every 3 months we used to go there uh, and then we used to keep observations on 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 the roost and on these species over there and after this uh, we started uh, with because we are armed with assent and also the local press and print media saying for wider outreach of these of these facts that of this information that we had with us so we want, we we talk to the local administration saying that mining activity has to stop immediately or the only roost in the whole world holding the you know kola leafmos bat will be lost forever and it would be a huge huge blotch on the administration of kola that's what we started to project the same thing we told to the uh, you know local forest department and in the press meets and for and to the newspaper local newspaper people also we started to uh, you know share all the scientific information we never hid any information we told them about all the scientific knowledge that we had gathered saying that this is a very important bat very few in numbers and and this is the only place because we, when we went back to terali we could not find this species over there at all so it had locally become extinct in in that area and this is just 10 kilometers away from hanmanali and it had become extinct over there so this was the only roost if this is the only roost that was uh, known for hippocytus hypophilus and we aggressively we wanted to protect that and we did not leave it at there we started to talk to the uh, villagers this is the village panchayat uh, office it's a, it was a very very tiny office that's the reason why we couldn't take a good photograph of all the people so we started to you know uh, 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 come up with posters stickers uh, um, pamphlets anything to you know uh, 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 make them all involved in 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 conservation because we 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 were from, telling them that this is your wealth it is found only here and you need to uh, uh, take care of this and we are there to help you take care and protect this place so th these are all the villagers we we used to hold uh, uh, meetings in the night times in, in the mornings any time we can so that you know we can drill in the 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 the, the importance of protection of this uh species we also talked to the school children over there and then held activities saying that you know this is a roost kind of activities if you destroy this roost piece by piece all the bats will have to move away and then they will die because of exposure to elements all those kind of activities we used to do then we also uh held a signature campaign talking to them very very clearly saying that are you interested to stop mining over here would it would it affect you in any way if we stop mining they they all said no it wouldn't and in fact it will help us if we stop uh, if the mining is stopped because of because because of mining their crops and their whole uh, habitat was getting destroyed because of the constant movement of trucks going over there 
So they they also wanted the ban of mining, and the, our bag became a, a source of or, you know a, 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 an excuse so that you know the mining can be stopped. So they all signed. If you can see this paper over here, they all signed. There were more papers. I've taken picture of one. They all signed, and then we we submitted this to the local administration, saying that we really we and the villagers want the ban of mining over there for the protection of the habitat and and the species. And these are all the children, the villagers, everyone over here, uh, who who came up to the site. This is this is the uh, 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 hill, and they are sitting away from the cave. Came up to the site. They wanted to see where this bat is, how it looks like, and this was early evening. So that was the uh, first time we, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Srinivasu um, and uh, uh, Aditya went into the cave. They collected a couple of specimens of the bat, quickly showed them that this is how beautiful your species looks like and then release them back into the cave safely. So those bats went away. And then when all these people physically saw that how tiny and beautiful this is, they were like really, really supporting us uh, to the core. And they also wanted the protection of that bat. And secondly, what we did was first we uh, put out scientific information. Second, using that scientific information, we, you know, uh, talked to all the local authorities uh, and also all the, you know, uh, village panchayat, the, the, the school children, the villagers, everyone, and also throughout Kolar, Bangalore, Hyderabad, everywhere we started to, you know, put out scientific information in print media so that everyone and anyone who is reading all these in different languages can become aware of this beautiful bat and how perilous its, its existence is and how important it is to you know, protect the species. And then we moved to the uh, state uh, forest department. He uh, sir is, was the head of the force over here, uh, head of the forest force. So we went over there, we talked to him again, the, uh, awareness conservation awareness programs were constantly going on meeting of uh, officials was going on and over here uh, in in january 2015 um, one of these officials he came and then he declared that the local government has banned mining in hanmanalli area this is the geo that came out in 2015 saying that you know it has the mining has been banned so it was a it was a uh, one you know one wonderful step towards protection of the species so even till now if you go there the villagers are so very uh, dedicated towards the protection of the species and the habitat that the miners who have left all those cut stones on the hill are still lying there and those cut stones are at least worth uh, in Indian rupees, 10, 15 lakhs, it's still lying there. The villagers and uh, nobody else uh, touches them. And the villagers have taken upon themselves to not give access to anyone to, you know, bring those uh, stones out. So this happened in 2015. Uh, awareness activities were going on, meeting of officials were going on. Then we also met up with the uh, biodiversity board uh, official uh, and also talked to him about it. And in uh, 2019, January 10th, um, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, January 10th, 2019, it was declared as Kola Leaf Nose Bat Conservation Reserve. This was a huge, huge step for uh, us uh, and for also the, the local uh, villagers of Hanmanhali, a huge victory because generally NGOs or, or government uh, or you know, the government itself decides to create any protective areas or the NGOs fight and protest or whatever. We were armed with scientific knowledge 
uh, scientific facts and information. We took that and then we spoke even to the locals using all this scientific knowledge and then said that you need to protect these bats and they are your wealth. So we also helped them set up a um, biodiversity management uh, committee. It, it, it gives them the power to manage whatever biodiversity that is there in their jurisdiction and also ownership rights uh, that whatever biodiversity, even a single blade of grass is under the ownership of the Hanmanhalli villages. So if I want to access even that grass also, I have to come and ask the permission of the, for, of the Hanmanhalli villagers saying that I'm interested in that particular piece of grass, then I have to go and take that. And whatever I earn from that, I have to give a, a percentage of it to the Karnataka Biodiversity Board, which gives that to the uh, BNC of Hanmanali. So we helped them set up that also. And then it gave, gave them a sense of ownership to the whole area. And so now we don't, uh, uh, we used to not go much often, like every three months. Now we go every six months. And it's all being conserved very well by the villages and because of this conservation reserve it's all fenced now and there is a watch and ward force by the forest department and everyone is uh, taking care of the habitat and uh, in in uh, after the uh, recent taxonomy workshop we went to hanmanalli and then we saw a huge swarm of you know bats emerging from two three exits in uh, of that cave, there were there 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 was another exit that was found due to loose stones on the other side of the hill. From there, also all these bats. So the the, the population of the bats has increased tremendously because of the uh, uh, you know protection that was given, and also the habitat improved uh, tremendously. There's greenery everywhere because when we went there for the first time in 2013 the whole of the land was parched and completely dusty because of the mining because there was no uh, uh, you know rains and the whole of the habitat was slowly and slowly getting degraded because of the protection that was given and the awareness that the villagers got that the mining stopped and from 2015 onwards slowly and slowly the habitat has healed and now it's a very uh, wonderful place to see and the forest department has taken creation of water bodies and all areas uh, on the um, uh, other side uh, of the hello Varsha can you hear me Yes, ma'am, we can all yeah. hear you. Sorry, yeah. sorry. Uh, I just got a message, that's all. Okay. So uh, all these check dams and uh, uh, such kind of artificial water bodies were also are also being constructed. So the bats now have, you know, number of water sources and rotation of crops is also happening uh, in the village, uh, in the surrounding cropping areas. So it's, it's a beautiful place to see now in comparison to earlier. And in early, when, when, we, when we had gone for the first time on the hill, we saw three more uh, shallow subterranean uh, caves that were completely smoked by the miners. And most probably we might have lost lots of bats that were roosting in those shallow uh, cave areas. They were completely smoked and then we could, you know, feel the soot with our fingers uh, over there. But if you, if when we went back uh, in, in 2020, we saw that, you know, these bats, because they are uh, in huge numbers, they are slowly recolonizing these uh, uh, shallow uh, you know, subterranean caves and then they are you know using that as temporary roosting sites uh, while they are feeding uh, in the surrounding lake and crop areas. So it was a very happy and pleasing sight to see and we all celebrated when we when we came to know about this. We, we all in a sense 
uh, our team and the villagers, we all, you know, distributed sweets to each other and then we celebrated. So this is how we did our uh, uh, work and hopefully we are hoping the other day uh, during our surveys, we, we did, uh, uh, you know, encounter some um, uh, location calls of this species in Terali. So we are uh, positive that most probably the the, the num numbers might have increased to such an extent that they might have, you know, they might be colonizing other intermediate areas uh, around Harman Ali and, and so we can see them in Therali also. So we are hoping like that. It's, it's, it was a wonderful um, uh, uh, experience while we were uh, trying to, uh, 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 you know, uh, record the location calls of, of this species. If, if Sanjan uh, can rec uh, recollect Anabat, he and I uh, had Anabats back then in Tirnalvili. Uh, 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 and it was absolutely impossible to record the, the echolocation calls of these bats on our anabats. And then we were just wondering what is happening, why we were not getting any calls at all. We weren't successful in the first few attempts between 2013, 2014, like that, to, to be able to re record the echolocation calls. So we had to invest in a, a D500, for which I had approached uh, Rufford and thankfully Rufford funded me and I could get a D500. And in that I could uh, get the location calls of this species. And uh, it's, 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 it's a wonderful feeling when, when, when you could record them and then you could see the recordings for the first time. So uh, all in all, this whole uh, experience was wonderful. And I'm, um, uh, in 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 the future, like moving forward, what we did was we have formulated a, a conservation action plan based on all our scientific information and our experiences in the field over all these years. And then we have submitted it to the local forest department and also to the state forest department, and uh, even shared it with uh, Dr. Sanjay Mulur so that you know he can give his own uh, inputs uh, to us. And uh, we have also received uh, a small funding from Bat Conservation International for doing some ecological works uh, for enhancing our understanding about these species. So that's my talk. Thank you very much. I was supported and funded by Ruford, MBZ, and always supported by Zoo, Osman University, Gareth, CBCS and my uh, postdoc was by UGC. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Varsha. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for such an amazing talk. Uh, we got to know a lot, about, a lot about the history of wildlife conservation in India today mm -hmm. through you. Thank and uh, the things that you've been doing since many years for the conservation of bats. Uh, so. I would, I would like to request everybody, if you have any questions, uh, you can add them in the chat box. So meanwhile, uh, I have some questions for you too. Sure. Uh, like, <clears throat> we all know that you did your PhD uh, on birds and then you shifted it to bats. So <clears throat> what encouraged you or what inspired you to like change your uh, subject of uh, uh, research after your PhD? Uh, what sparked your interest in bats? Uh, after I finished my PhD, I, uh, during my PhD, and uh, 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 um, I came to know that there were literally handful of bat researchers in India. Literally, we could count them on our fingers. So uh, that was a huge lacunae and bats are so uh, less studied, less known. And uh, there were lots of, there are lots of myths attached to bats. So I wanted to really uh, 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 do some studies to understand and also uh, try to dispel these myths uh, among people. So that's the reason why I have to uh, studies on bats. 
Wow. Uh, I'm sure after listening to your presentation, after listening to your talk, many students, many amateurs have been inspired till now. Thank uh, you. And another thing, uh, India and Nepal, uh, being neighboring countries, share a lot uh, in common uh, in history, regarding in history as well. Yeah. Uh, so you talked about, talked a lot about uh, wildlife conservation and the hunt uh, and the hunting that was going yeah. on in India during the British rule. And similar kind of thing was also going going on in Nepal at that time because uh, the then Rana prime ministers of Nepal, they used to like host uh, British royals in Nepal to yeah. uh, do hunt to hunt tigers and yep. uh, lions in the Tarai region of in the True. plain areas of Nepal. So similar to, to that of India, Nepal also saw a decline in rhino and tigers population as well. And yeah. seeing that Rana's, what, what the uh, royals here in Nepal did was they also created a hunting reserve uh, mm. in the Tarai region of Nepal so that uh, they could uh, again hunt those animals uh, once their population is, yeah, that's uh, what. Yeah, population increases. So yeah. after that, uh, after the Rana rule, what uh, that hunting reserve became the national park, uh, which we today know as Achitwa National Park in Nepal. Yeah. yeah. So the, the, the Achitwa National Park is the habitat for rhinos and tigers in Nepal yeah. as well. So yeah. that was quite quite amazing to hear uh, through you about India as well. <laughs> and uh, I also wanted to know, like you uh, talked about uh, the uh, during uh, Mughal. Uh, uh, Raj in India, people mm. used to like, they used to worship and uh, treat animals like uh, they should be, they also have the right to be protected, they, uh, they also have the right to live. So people used to also worship them. And how is that, uh, uh, has that mentality, I mean, uh, how do pe people perceive animals today? Uh, because in uh, in the past you said that people used to like they you they used to treat uh, animals uh, treat uh, used to treat wildlife in a very good way they used to worship them so what did you find uh, during your research work how did people perceive uh, the wildlife in the area especially bats no uh, since time memorial immemorial it's more like you know we are fearing animals and also we are revering them so. We are worshipping, at the same time, we are still killing animals. That is going on uh, in, in, in many parts. Like uh, I have heard Dr. Srinivasan telling me in, in his surveys, he has heard uh, uh, people uh, who were doing penance in caves in certain pockets in, uh, in certain areas in Andhra Pradesh, that these bats are uh, souls of uh, ancient people hanging upside down and then um, meditating and so they should not be disturbed so you should not enter any caves that was that was also told and uh, you, you can see in the studies of Dr. Uh, Bhai P. Sinha that you know he has seen many uh, communities in Bihar uh, 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 revering bats as goddess Lakshmi uh, who is granting them wealth because of the presence of bats, their crops are good. That's what they used to think. So even when we were doing our uh, surveys, uh, we have seen uh, in people's uh, um, uh, um, cow sheds, there used to be bats and they were very tolerant of it because they used to say that they are also organisms, let them be, they are not harming us and they are, we are fine with them. And they used to be very tolerant. And even uh, when we went recently also, a uh, few months back, we saw that that colony is still existing even after so many years. So at the same time, in, Anna, in other parts, uh, we have seen that, you know, people uh, catch bats and then eat them because they feel that, you know, the bats, if you eat, uh, it cures your asthma or, you know, uh, fry them and then extract oil and then apply it to the, uh, you know, disabled children's limbs so that, you know, the limbs become all right and all those things. So both the aspects are uh, equally uh, existence in, in existing in India. Uh, so uh, we, we all know that uh, research and uh, the conservation awareness program 
things uh, need to go hand in hand together. Doing only scientific research is also not uh, will will not help us conserve any species or or wildlife. We have to do conservation awareness program together with that. So uh, while doing such programs in the area, uh, like how uh, how did you find the students? How did you find the children or the locals? Uh, like responding, responding to your uh, lectures or, res or responding to the programs that you have been doing in the area? What we all did is we, for the first thing we did was we shared- How challenging our, was that? Actually, I wanted to ask, how challenging uh, was that? It wasn't challenging for a reason. The, the moment we started to interact with the uh, locals, whether it is elders or youngsters, we first try uh, shared our academic persona that you know we are MSc or doctorates or whatever. We just left that, and then we are individuals talking to you as an individual, respecting you because you are the local of the place with your local knowledge. You are much more greater than us. We have knowledge of books or whatever. It doesn't ma matter at this point of time. Your knowledge of the local area is more important. You are greater than us. So we used to talk to them at that level, at a lower, humble level, saying that you, you are there. Please protect this. These are the facts. These are the things. So that's how it is. And then we uh, uh, went with lots of pictures and information. And then we showed them how it looks like. And we, we made it that, so that, you know, you are important for the protection of the species. If you don't protect, then it, it's not possible. So we made them important and we are at the back of you. We are not in the, for, in the front. We are at the back of you to support you. You are going to, you should protect. That's how we say. So we made them the focus of attention. Because generally what happens is uh, whoever approaches the locals, because we are all city bred, we, we, when we approach the locals, we tend to look down upon them. And then that we didn't want to do and then that we didn't do wherever we went. So that made a huge difference. Okay, so uh, uh, you uh, recently also, uh, you today also shared about uh, uh, bat reserve that has been asked uh, uh, that has been uh, in the Hanumanlali area that yeah. you had worked for yeah. so uh, thank you for first of all congratulations for that thank uh, you for your hard work as well yeah um, so the things that you had mentioned about uh, the threats that bats have been facing in uh, India like people perceive some people uh, in, in some cases people perceive bats as uh, good animals I mean uh, they worship them as goddess yeah. Lakshmi which is also uh, in uh, in some cases in Nepal as, as well and some people also fear bats and they treat them as bad omen yeah. and some people also think about them as medicine like you hmm. said as the cure for hepatitis and tuberculosis in humans and uh, we have also heard about uh, treating baby uh, baby seosis, that is the uh, the problem or urinary problem in cattle that bat meat can be used to cure them so similar kind of things have been observed all uh, in different parts of the world people yeah. have their different kinds of notions and beliefs uh, about bats so yeah. so what do you think you have come this far in bat research and conservation so what do you think what more things need to be done uh, so what uh, what do you want to uh, uh, suggest the new uh, generation researchers the amateurs who want to follow your path so what do you want to suggest what things are yet to be done and uh, what do you, what do you want to suggest i feel many more should take up bat studies because they no matter what uh, see i still need to know more about its ecology Right? I've been working on this species, but still there are there's something more to be known. So in a similar manner, we have like so many species of bats in India, 133 species of bats. So, so much more needs to be known about each species of bat. And then, and we have very few bat researchers. So if we have more bat researchers and then they equip themselves with the scientific knowledge, the, the, Right from basics onwards, from the taxonomy onwards, if you if you know what your 
species is then you can conserve it if you don't know and then you you know just rely on echolocation or say uh, molecular uh, uh, techniques you wouldn't know exactly what species you're you're having in your hand and how how to do how to go about and then how to conserve it so we need to equip ourselves with all the basic knowledge about all the fields of taxonomy and then with that scientific knowledge go forward and then uh, uh, do conservation education among all the strata of all the stakeholders because you need to have everybody along with you you can't do it alone you have to have the grassroots level communities with you the officials uh, everyone have to be with you. you you have to work together and then only the conservation can happen properly and that, i mean this is one of the success stories that i want to say that happened because we all work together all the the, the communities the researchers the officials all of us put together have worked to achieve this so that's how i feel that you know yes everybody has to come together yeah for conserving the species so uh, ma'am i think uh, we have we are uh, actually getting out of time today maybe uh, mm -hmm. and uh, your presentation presentation was just really amazing ma'am it was Thank uh, you so like much. eye opening for us uh, the because when I met you in Hyderabad, uh, we did not know anything about uh, like what you were doing uh, for Kolar Leaf Nose Bat and the uh, and the conservation actions that you have been you had been planning uh, for and the things that you have done till date. We were unaware of that, so it was really amazing to uh, hear from you about these things. So I think we will get to the end of the session. Uh, the last section of our session today. So I would like to invite Mr. Sanjan Thapa uh, for his concluding remarks. And uh, Mr. Sanjan Thapa uh, is one of the founder members of SMCRF and he is currently working as a researcher here, here as well. Mr. Sanjan Thapa is evidently known for his commendable work in bat yeah. research and conservation in Nepal with more than a decade of experience. Sure. So, uh, so I would like to request Mr. Sanjan Thapa for his concluding remarks and thank you so much, Bhargavi, ma'am, for your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, over to you, Mr. Sanjan Thapa. Thank you very much, Bursa. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vargavi, for your gracious presentation over here. And we are very lucky to see you here in our uh, Wild and Life uh, Wild and Life series. Uh, Hi, Sanjin. How are you? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, yeah. Thank you and very much for inviting me, Sanjin. Yeah, it was our great pleasure and it was an honor to see you in this program. However, I'm very, uh, I mean, it's unfortunate to see that we, we there were a very less number of people interested in this um, uh, series. However, uh, I will I will like to take an opportunity uh, in this platform to introduce uh, Dr. Vargavi, who is a very well-established uh, biodiversity expert and a renowned uh, but biologist in South Asia and beyond. And she is also an inspiration to all of us in, in the global Thank south. You. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. And uh, she, although she is a female scientist and she is, and she is an inspiration to, to, to all of us because there are very, a very few number of uh, women scientists uh, in global south and also in the Indian subcontinent. And uh, see today, uh, uh, we were very lucky to to hear about uh, her deliberations uh, regarding uh, deep knowledge on the philosophy and uh, uh, civilization and the history of the Indian conservation of the species, including uh, that of the bat. And the more important thing was she brought back the background of zoo outreach organization, its establishment and the contribution of Sally Walker and uh, her legacy, and it was very nice to hear about uh, how the zoo outreach organization was established and the legacy continued uh, by Dr. Vargivi herself and Dr. Uh, Srinivaslu too. And um, she uh, focused on the collar leaf nosed bat, which is an endemic species to India, uh, though it's not found elsewhere in South Asia. And however, it was interesting to know uh, that the species was misidentified for a long time and uh, 
re-identified uh, uh, very recently in 2013, uh, if I'm not wrong, or maybe uh, yeah, re-identified. And also, she also found the species uh, from a very uh, from a single location, which is the only uh, known habitat of the bats and where she worked for the conservation of the bats through the protection of its habitat. And uh, uh, it's a, a very nice uh, talk uh, and about the success story of conservation of a species, a single species of bats in the conservation history of India. And um, uh, she was lucky that she could not only record the collar leaf nose bat, but also the Durga Dasi and uh, Durga Dasi Epicidrus Durga Dasi, which is another uh, greatly threatened bat, uh, probably uh, endangered species, another or vulnerable species, maybe. Yeah. And uh, uh, they worked with the conservation for us, it's a long time. And for this species, they approached to the uh, decision makers, uh, to the local people. And they continued the monitoring of the species. And uh, also uh, they brought back into the attention of the media. And uh, this is a very great example and a success story because they included the common, uh, they worked for the community ownership of the, of the uh, for the conservation of the species and particularly for the bats. And it's a very great example indeed. Uh, and uh, finally, with very uh, um, hard effort, uh, they could succeed uh, to persuade the local government and to, to get uh, result-oriented conservation through Kola Leaf Nose Bat Conservation Reserve. And in her own words, the local people's wealth is now in their hands. So congratulations, Director Vargavi. Thank you, thank you. And uh, uh, it's a great pleasure to to call you and to see you in this program. And thank you very, very, very Likewise. much for your uh, long term support uh, as always. Thank you so much, Sanjan. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Sanjan Thapa. And thank you so much, Dr. Bhargavi again. So to inform everybody, uh, whoever has not, uh, has not been able to join uh, today's program, maybe due to their uh, commitments and all, we'll be posting our, uh, this video of this presentation on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. You can uh, search for this video anytime and uh, you can have a look at it. You can see it and uh, learn about Dr. Bhagavi's work on bats in uh, India. So thank you very much everyone, whoever is present here today and see you all next time during our sixth episode of Violent Life Seminar Series. Thank you so much, Dr. Bhagavi. It was thank you, a pleasure to host you and see you. Bye-bye. <laughs>